Welcome, everybody. We are very happy to see all of you. And we are, several are now arriving, coming in. Welcome again. My name is Salvador Morales, and I work for the Network Hemisphere for Shorebirds. And we are in this webinar series. This is the third webinar, a little bit doing a retrospective. We had our first webinar and at the end we were asking if at the end the productive systems can offer a hamburger, that's what he said. It was a nut nutritious meal or just a fast food. And that is one of the questions. Then in the second webinar, we had the presentation of uh, beyond what we can see, uh, the issue of uh, what we don't see, the pollutants, the potential effects. These two presentations are online and you can see them any time. And today we are, are happy to have Juanita Fonseca my colleague, and she will tell us about the experience from Mexico, all the good practices in aquaculture, and if possible, if possible, to have this harmony between the shorebirds and the productive systems, like the shrimp farms. And uh, I'm going to introduce Juanita, Juanita, is a biologist, a PhD in aquatic resources by the University of Sinaloa. Her interest is in ecology and conservation of shorebirds in different wetlands, uh, considering uh, the use of the water birds of all these areas. And her thesis, she evaluated the shrimp farms and their importance for the conservation of shorebirds, studying the availability of food and uh, during the non-reproductive season. Juanita has collaborated and guided different research projects in shrimp farms in the northeastern part of Mexico, where they have identified good management practices for the conservation of shorebirds through this scientific work. The doctor, uh, wants to improve the habitat for the shorebirds in these uh, areas. Right now, she's working as a specialist in conservation for the executive office of the Wilson from Mexico. And uh, she has a scholarship from the University of Cornell. Recently, in addition, she has been included into the National Group of Researchers in Mexico. So it's an honor to have Juanita with us today. And I'm going to give her the mic. If you have any questions, you can start writing the questions in the chat. And I'm going to uh, Juanita. Juanita, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salvadora. I hope you can hear me. OK. And thanks, everybody, for participating in this series of webinars on shorebirds and productive systems. And before starting, I would like to ask you if you believe that the shorebirds and the shrimp farms can uh, coexist in a friendly way. Some will say, say yes, some will say no, and others, they don't know if it is possible. And this is because of the lack of knowledge that we have on how these systems work and how the birds use these sites. We also need a little bit of participation from different sectors to move forward in specific actions. And we're gonna go back to this question a little bit later. During this presentation, I'm gonna show you some results of the work of several years of work in shrimp farms in Mexico. And we are going to talk a little bit about the shrimp farms, where they are physically. We're going to talk how they work, their, uh, their reproductive, their, their productive cycle, and also 
when the birds use these uh, sites, these shrimp farms, for how long do the birds stay there? What do the birds do in these sites? And some uh, recommendations that can help and uh, help the birds. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the shrimp is the most important product all over the world. For example, Mexico is has seen an important growth in uh, shrimp farms and um, is considered as one of the most important in Latin America. Mexico is the second biggest producer of shrimp in the shrimp farms in Latin America and at the world level, it is, has a 17th place. There are three productive systems for shrimp and in Mexico, the one they use the most is the semi-intensive. The development of these shrimp farms has been, can be found in the Northeastern part of Mexico in the states of Sonora, Sinaloa and Nayarit. In these states, they represent more than 90% of the shrimp production in the country. And, and from these states, Sinaloa is the most important one in shrimp farms or covering more than 80,000 hectares. And well, with the uh, shrimp production that will vary every year. And this will depend, this will depend uh, on, uh, because of the different diseases that they have in these shrimp farms and which could affect the production system. And uh, this Northeastern region together with the peninsula is one of the most important areas for the shorebirds in the Pacific migratory route for more than 1 million birds spend their winters here of uh, the, the places important for the shorebirds in the hemispheric route for the shorebirds, 14 sites can be found in this northeastern region. Especially in the state of Sinaloa, we find five important sites, and this will depend on the different category, and this will depend on the number of shorebirds that use these sites at a certain date. And here we can show you the placement of these shrimp farms. For example, here we have Bahia Santa Maria and, uh, and uh, borders with the state of Nayarit. And also we have here the Estero de Urias in Mazatlan. If you can see these, this wetland is not considered as an important site in the Wilson network. It is an area crossed by an important number of shorebirds at a regional level. What we can also see here is where, where can we see the shrimp farms in Sinaloa and uh, all along the coast, they have the development of these shrimp farms. Where are they built? Normally, they, you can find them or they're built where they are or they used to be some some muddy flats, for example, here, you see some pictures of the natural area and where now we have shrimp farms, these places were used by some shorebirds as a resting place, but also they can be used by other species also. This change of the habitat is not only for the construction of shrimp farms, but because of other productive activities like uh, agriculture, you together with human development has affected the area. Now, yes, yeah. There was a slight problem. We will now continue. 
uh, even though of this change of the habitat, not only because of the shrimp farms, but because of other agri agricultural products that have caused changes in the uh, diversity and has also affected the coastal land. They also represent some opportunities to integrate these productive activities with uh, protection of the birds. Just a minute, please. In this chart, we can show you the annual productive cycle of the shrimps. We can start with uh, what will be the healthy drying up of the area, about 40 days to dry it up. And it will consist of blocking the doors so water will not come into these tanks. Then these tanks, water tanks, or uh, we they use some products to disinfect once after this period, about March, then they start flooding these areas and planting the larvae for the shrimp during this period. It coincides with the flying north of the of the shorebirds and they're not available for the shorebirds, but in April and until June, the shrimp farms provide nesting area and for some shorebirds. And in July, depending on the shrimp farm, they do the first harvest of the shrimp or the pre-harvest, that is they decrease, they lower the water level so they can decrease the density of the shrimp or they harvest all the tank and they plant again. Later on between October, December, they have a second period of harvesting. And this is the most important part because it coincides with the migration of the shorebirds going south. During this period, the water tanks provide an important food source for the shorebirds and like Dr. Naveda said in the previous webinar, these areas are available for a short window of time. And it's about four to five days only. But however, in some water tanks where they have some water level, the use of these sites can be a little bit more long for some species. Here in this short video, I will show you uh, recently harvest water tank and how the birds start using this site. Generally, these birds move from the natural areas, from the intertidal to these shrimp farms. And uh, uh, they also move between tanks that have been already harvested. The shorebirds in these shrimp farms is 25 different species of shorebirds that use these sites. The most important ones because of abundance, Western Sandpiper, Dowd Witchers, and uh, other, this pattern has been seen in different shrimp farms where we have work, done studies, and with the differences in their abundance depending on the specific site where we can find this shrimp farm in particular. We have seen also important populations for some species and some with a international interest for the conservation, <coughs> like the Western Sandpiper, the witches and the Bullet. Most of the species, they use these sites, as I said, they use during the harvesting period as a food resource about between 60 and 90% uh, use the food from these tanks. What do they eat? Especially, they use polychaetes and some species also eat crabs. And uh, this will depend on the preferences of uh, the species using these sites. For example, uh, for marble godwit, this represents is the most important prey for their diet. and. Uh, the one that contributes the most biomass and 
for the marble godwit, the most frequent, the polycats and less crabs, but if these are muscles, these provide the greater biomass for these species. This selection of prey in their diet is also uh, according to the food availability in these sites. So we did uh, an assessment of the food availability of the food during three years. And uh, what we could see was the availability of food is different for each year. And also what we can see is that uh, there's a difference, there's a decrease in the density and the biomass four days after they harvest the tank. These are the gray bars considered uh, relative to the black bar and this pattern. Well, however, there is not a difference between the density of the biomass for a particular year for that is uh, 2014. And this could be related to the total length of the harvesting cycle of the shrimp, which has an influence in the growth. We also were interested in assessing if this food availability was due because the tank is drying up or because there's a predation from the birds. So we did an experiment in some tanks where we placed some excluders that would not let the birds come and feed from this resource and another control lots where the birds could feed. So this experiment was done during the first three days. So we could be sure that there would not be any kind of effect of the tank that it was drying up. Also the experiment we placed about near the canals where the water goes out so that uh, it will always be have moisture. So, we just found polycats in our samples, 96% is for these species and 4% of the capital A family. What we could see also is that there is no reduction by cost by the birds in these water tanks during the first three days, but there was an effect in the biomass, a reduction of 43% in the biomass and a, why did we have this reduction? This reduction is due because the birds uh, start with the biggest, bigger, bigger prey, which caused this reduction in the biomass. And also it, it caused that the density of uh, short birds feeding in the water tanks also decreased during the first three days. I was also saying that uh, shrimp farms are used as, uh, as reproductive areas for their shorebirds. We did uh, some uh, trips to the shrimp farm where we were working in Mazatlan. I forgot to say that in this shrimp farm, this is where we are working. Almost 10 years working in this shrimp farm. So in some trips, we saw that some species had some nest. So then we made two or three trips in 2017 to 2020. And we found that the nest of the shorebirds, they place their nest on the edge of the water tanks and some place their nest on the road. So far we have found three species of shorebirds reproducing in these areas and last year, we found this species that is also using this, uh, the shrimp farm as a reproductive area. So what we can see is that uh, we find a greater number of nests followed by the Wilson plover, but it is very possible that there could be a greater number of nests because we only made one or two trips per year. Uh, another thing that we found is that the shorebirds, these shorebirds that are uh, breeding here, do not do not go to the sites with greater disturbance. 
they are far away from where there is more traffic. Here, I will show you three areas where we have the greater number of nests of these four species. I don't know if you can see it, but uh, here, this is the entrance to the farm. And here, these areas are those that are farther away from the main roads where we have less traffic of the employees. So the shorebirds try to avoid placing their nests in, in areas with a greater disturbance. There's another area where we have greater, a greater number of nests. This is about two, four acres. It is not a water tank, it is an area used by um, for maintenance of the roads. So it doesn't have a lot or the, not a lot of traffic by the people. During these years of study, uh, how, what are their, the connectivity of the shorebirds to these areas? So, so we captured shorebirds in this shrimp farm using uh, nets. We placed them in a water tank that was just recently harvested, so in the afternoon. So later we could do the captures at night. This is one of the pictures of the captures that we got in that shrimp farm. And also we captured other types of sea, uh, of water birds. And uh, what we do, we take some morphometric measures and other data and we place a band so we can identify them. And uh, since we have been following up this uh, shrimp farm for several years, what we have seen is that some of these individuals that we banded, we have seen them in later years and in fact, this uh, oyster catcher, we banded it as a chick. And next year, we could see it again in the train, same shrimp farm, but uh, it's not always easy to see these individuals, at least in the tertidal area, because it was um, a little bit risky, uh, difficult access. And now what we can see, what we can do now, together with Dr. McGrever, and Dr. Uh, and other people, Scott, we are placing nano tags for some shorebirds like Calidris Maori. We're going to also go place some uh, tags or nano tags. And we're going to, so, so we're going to have more precise information for the connectivity of the shorebirds to these sites and their natural sites, and also to get information on the movement of the shorebirds towards the reproductive area. Also, we have, uh, last year, we found some fecal samples to make an assessment of the microplastics. Dr. Scott is doing this. And uh, this is uh, work will allow us to have more knowledge of the use of these sites by the birds. It will also allow us to identify important sites and that will contribute to the conservation measures of the shorebirds in these areas. So what can we do to help the shorebirds? These are some of the recommendations that uh, we have suggested that we can do in these shrimp farms. The first that we considered most important is to have a, a moisture, moisture in the substrate so we can extend the use of the birds of these areas if this area was harvested in October and the last tank is harvested in December, this tank will have a window of more than a month so that the birds can use these sites again. Also, we recommend uh, well, um, a constant harvest, uh, not more than five days, so we can guarantee opportunities of stable food for the shorebirds. And finally, to decrease disturbance in these areas. We know that in the shrimp farms, every day there's movement because they have to check the different uh, tanks. They have to feed the shrimp. But I consider we can identify, like I showed you, some areas which are used by the shorebirds as a nesting area so we could find some strategies 
to decrease the disturbance in these areas during the harvest, for example, during the entire growth cycle of the shrimp, there's a conflict with some uh, water birds that use these sites uh, and uh, also they affect the shorebirds that are using these sites. So we can find some strategies to reduce this disturbance and, and as much as possible, the, we shouldn't have any disturbance. This is possible to do within the practice of the semi-intensive uh, stream farm without affecting the productive cycle and also considering the needs of the shrimp producers. In 2020, we did some visits to so, uh, shrimp farm in Senada and Pabellones to talk about some good practices. We had some meetings with the people in charge of these shrimp farms and the workers, we told them about, about what we were doing how the birds use these areas and the steps they can do to help the birds. And they were very participated and very willing to apply these steps. Some shrimp farms, what we consider most important what is that uh, when feeding the shrimp, some shrimp farms are already doing it. And uh, when they harvest the shrimp, they leave the door open and that would allow to have it available for a lot more longer time. And the results of this work are still in process. We are analyzing all this data, but with this assessment, what we're gonna do with the next step, and thanks to the project of the people is to implement these uh, management practices in Ensenada de Pabellones, and also to try to apply this management system to other shrimp farms in the area. These management uh, practices are economical and they are compatible with the activities of the shrimp producers. And also these management practices, there are more shrimp practices like uh, David said in the previous webinar. However, we still need a lot more work, a lot more study to assess these um, practices and have a good assessment in the future for the shrimp farms in Mexico. Which are our, which are our goals to promote different practices to help the shorebirds. And also we want to promote the interest of the agriculture industry for conservation and also to build alliances between the uh, shrimp farms, the government, uh, to reach agreements to apply all this. And finally, it is important we to the conservation of shorebirds, it is possible also if we are all in, in a consensus and if the shrimp farmers can have a benefit also regarding these conservation strategies. It is to promote a certificate uh, program to improve the habitat and will be beneficial economically. And this last point we're working about, we're working on this with Salvadora and other people to try to integrate all the different management practices, all the suggestions that we can have in different areas to see how we can adapt all these management practices to promote this certificate in a nearby future. This also has the collaboration of Arturo Ruiz, Cristiana Pendini, and Salvador Morales, and many other collaborators that at a given moment will participate with this proposal. Also would like to thank the shrimp farmers that are pioneers and are committed for these strategies, management strategies can be applied. I would also like to thank many, many people that have participated and collaborated 
during all these years of study in the shrimp farm and also the different institutions that have helped us with financing so this for this to be possible and that's all i have thank you so much and if we have any questions i would like to answer them thank you juanita we have one question from daniel galindo it says what is the average size of one of these tanks in Sinaloa? Average size. The average size will vary a lot. For example, in Don Jorge, where we have been working, the tanks that measure uh, about an acre, and Ensenada Paviones, the others that are about 50 acres, from one acre to 50 acres. And uh, semi intensive systems. The average is 20 to, 100, 20 to 100 hectares. Another question, the next word, Eduardo. Thank you for the presentation. Is there a certificate process like agricultures that considers the management for the conservation of shorebirds in Mexico? That is, well, Salvador. You might answer they are not contemplated in any certificate program we have not considered their shorebirds it has a little bit more uh, work to do on the environment and other strategies and their shorebirds are not included but what we are trying to do is to include their shorebirds in that certificate program it is important also to understand that the market of uh, the certificate is from Europe or also in the case of Mexico, the production is more local. There's a very small percentage that is exported and they're going into that process of being certified. Yes, we have some shrimps that are certified in Sonora and in Sinaloa. They are not. I don't know anyone that is certified in Sinaloa, but uh, all their shrimp, a lot of their shrimp from those shrimp farms are taken to uh, a farming out. They, they are frozen and then exported a little bit for, for local consumption, but uh, they should be certified. Do you think that the reception of these recommendations will be accepted by the great shrimp farms? What difficulties do you expect to find with the big shrimp farmers? The difficulties I've seen in uh, doing uh, studies in small shrimp farms, what we found is that uh, practically the same. Maybe the problem here is that there are many, many farms, many, many shrimp farmers. It is not just one that could have more than 10,000 shrimp farms or 10,000 hectares. So then we are working on it. We are working on it. We hope we don't have a lot of problems regarding the work we want to implement with these steps. Is there some kind of certificate of the loss of shorebird nest? Is there some kind of a quantifying how many shorebird nests are being lost because of a shrimp farm? No. Not that I know of. What I said, these shrimp farms are built on the marismas or wetlands. I don't know if there's any kind of previous study in these areas that the birds could have used as a nesting site. And also, I don't know of any study in shrimp farms already built shrimp farms that are 
how much are they used by the shorebirds as a nesting area? I don't have any information regarding that part. Gustavo? Do you know if they have assessed the impact of the building of shrimp farms on the natural habitat of the shorebirds? The certificate, will that change the natural habitat of the shorebirds? The first one, yes, there are some studies on satellite images about the sites where the shrimp farms were built. And if they're not built on the intertidal, yes, they are built next to the intertidal area. And I don't know if you can say it is a change of habitat, yes, but I don't know how much is the percentage of this change and how much is lost or how much it has been modified. And the other question is if the certificate could, uh, the idea of this management practices is for shrimp farms that are already built it is not for shrimp farms that are going to be built. What we want to do is the shrimp farms are already there. Each one has a different working style. So what we want is that these shrimp farms that we already have to try to give them a best management practice that could favor their shorebirds. And they're also used by other species like um, seabirds and to see how we can work together to achieve these uh, good practices. Are these good practices used for the shorebirds? Is there uh, any, anything published on the good practices? There's some work from Dr. Madero where they mentioned some management practices in another article. Last year, for example, also, we made some recommendations and uh, the idea is to do this year to have a manual of good practices on those shrimp farms. So we still do not have that manual, but we are going to work on it this year. The methodology and your practices are also applicable to the aquaculture. The question, because in my country, it is the Mediterranean and the great migratory routes are in this area, in the Mediterranean. Uh, it will depend. We have to know how the birds use these sites to assess. What the recommendation could vary depending on the system at the end. All, all the productive systems have uh, different, uh, different uh, parts so it could change a little, but the idea is to improve the conditions for the birds. Next question from Reynold is, you only have uh, color bands or metal bands and you don't use flags and which are the migratory shorebirds most abundant in Sinaloa? Are they spending the winter there or are just going through? Well, we use for some species, a combination of colors to identify them more easily in the field. And some species like limosa, willet, and we use flags with a code, with a number. For the oyster catcher, we also use some bands with a code and a metal band and, and the most abundant species are uh, red knot, limosa fedoa, semi palmata, semi palmated, and uh, shrimp farms. But in the natural areas, there are other species that are abundant and other species. Some species 
stay there to spend the winter there, but other species also migrate south. Gustavo, congratulations for your work. And uh, do you think that the shrimp farms have a different way of perceiving the birds as a threat? And can you do a recommendation to conserve their shorebirds? What I have seen is that they consider all the birds as a threat. But when you approach them and you explain, these are the shorebirds, they use the water tanks. When there's no more shrimp, after you harvest the shrimp, so uh, they change a little bit their perception. They say that they have a loss during the growth of the shrimp but through the cormorants or other seabirds, but in part, they understand that the shorebirds do not affect their productive cycle. So I believe, yes, at least with the people that we have talked, they understand the project and how we can move forward with these strategies. Yes, there is a, a good opportunity to integrate these recommendations. Erika Reyes, have you been able that in those shrimp farms uh, keep the water level moist more days and for how many days? Okay. We have been assessing that during the harvest season last year. And uh, what we can see is that uh, some shrimp farms, once they harvest, they leave the door open so that the water can come in. They leave it open until they start the health cycle again. So uh, it can be available for two months. But in some cases, if they leave the doors open, it will not benefit the birds so much because the amount of water coming in is a lot. So you have to manage those levels so that uh, the tanks can have so that the substrate can be muddy or uh, just, uh, just a low level of water. So we are working with them and we are just evaluating the, the results. River, if in addition to the good practices, do you see opportunities to restore abandoned places back to their natural habitat? That's a good question. Really, I assume that we have more than 80,000 hectares of agriculture and that number is changing every year, depending on the producer, if it's going to plant or not. But we also seen there are some shrimp that are abandoned for many, many years. And uh, we don't know the status of that shrimp farm if they are leased, if they have an owner or what, so we have to work along that idea. So I don't know how many shrimp farms that we have, what percentage, I don't know the percentage of those that are abandoned, if it is possible to do that work of restoration or management. So uh, we hope it is a good opportunity and that is something with it we have to access. If the shorebirds are those that represent a productive problem, what options, recommendations can you have for the, for the producers? What all the producers say is that their shorebirds are a problem. Really, we have not assessed how big is that problem or if it is meaningful or not. What I know is that in some shrimp farms in Sonora, they don't bother the birds, nor shorebirds, nor water birds. Many of those are, have a certificate and then they just let the species use those sites. We have to do some more research on, on these uh, stream farms. What measures do they use to mitigate that these shorebirds are using these tanks and uh, 
with this to see what we can use in Sinaloa to mitigate the disturbances for these birds. It is not that we don't care. We are focused on short birds, but I believe that, uh, that those strategies can also be extended for other species. And uh, just, we have to find how. Thank you, Juanita. I think we have answered all the questions they asked us. There were several, really. There are no more questions. Has been very interesting to know one of the elements, interesting elements and different elements uh, is that from Golfo de Fonseca is that in Golfo de Fonseca, it is almost like a constant harvesting. They don't stop in winter and uh, they continue producing. And uh, you stop in Mexico, but not in Golfo de Fonseca. So that lets us work more with the birds. What we have seen in this webinar is that each country has uh, its differences. So then the idea is to try to find a strategy that we can uh, uh, apply all the good practices from all these countries, at least to write one document considering the differences for all each country. Thank you, everybody. We would like to mention uh, the next webinar will be March the 17th. It will be a Wednesday, just like today. And we're gonna have one of the producers. It will be telling us a little bit from his perspective uh, the production, it will be from Honduras, one of the first shrimp farms installed in Central America. And we're going to send him, send you the details of the presentation and it will be approximately at the same time. Thanks everybody. I think we have another question. If there are no tanks that are harvested, where do the birds go? What we have seen is when they are not, when the tanks are not harvested, the birds do not use that trim farm. They use it as an optional site for food. We haven't seen many individuals of any species resting in these areas. So we don't know where they go when the shrimp farm are not available. When their intertidal area is not available, they move to these places, but if they're not available, then that is part of the work that we have, of the questions we have to answer with the use of the nanotags. There's a, we have a link here for the when, where you can find more information. It has focused on Golfo de Fonseca in Central America, but you can find a lot more information. I think we have reached the end. We'd like to thank everybody for participating. We have congratulations to Juanita and to all the entire team. Thanks everybody for participating and being with us. And we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye. In the next session. Bye.